Man, welcome to Crow Triple Seven Radio. This is episode 187. Jason Lingren is with me, and Wayne McCroy is back. We're going to go at a topic uh, Jason and I covered some time back. Seems like it might have been in the 70s, uh, episode 74. I'm guessing might not be right. We're going to do the RH factor again. When Jason and I initially did the research for this, man, did we find information that was contrary to the last information we looked up. We found it was a very obfuscated. Uh, thing to try to research. So Wayne McCroy has got involved and we're going to go with this again. Welcome, Jason. Good morning, Crow. All right. I'm pretty sure there's, is there anything for the intro that you want to put in? Not that I know of. We're getting too far into the future at this point. Yeah, we're, uh, we're trying to record as much as we can. So we're four or five episodes in the front here. Finally, instead of scrambling for it every week. Uh, Anyhow, welcome Wayne. Hi guys. Good to be back on. So before we jump in here and hand it to Jason to get the ball rolling down the road here, um, you just did your side of the research for RH. What was your impression? What was your overall, you know, 30,000 foot view looking back down on this topic? Uh, Well, it's a complicated topic to look at. And I think a lot of the information on it is obfuscated and uh, kind of uh, contradictory on purpose. And it it just kind of seems to be one of those things where they try and steer you off of the the general direction of things by going at it from two different opposing angles. So uh, I came to some conclusions with these two opposing angles, and we'll go over that in the notes today. Yeah, um, back when we had done this, and actually before that, we talked with someone from the Basque region, made contact with us. It was actually before we did that episode. That's one of the highest occurrences of RH negative, uh, which we'll redefine as we get in here. Uh, But what Jason and I also found was race had a lot to do uh, with the European research and other researches. All these people claiming they're the original human beings and everyone else is mutts. (laughs) Very confusing. But uh, you want to jump in here, Jason, pick up? Get us going. So, RH positive red blood cells have an antigenic glycoprotein layer attached to them that RH negative ones do not. This protein layer has been discovered to be an ammonium transporter as well as a CO2 transporter. Up until this discovery, it was completely unknown what function RH factor served. It was assumed that ammonium and CO2 were eliminated completely by diffusion, but this discovery changed this viewpoint. Now, it is still completely unknown how RH negative blood eliminates these waste materials, but it is still largely accepted that it is through diffusion. The fact that RH positive blood eliminates waste materials differently than RH negative blood could explain certain traits that are largely accepted to be associated with RH negative blood types. You know, when we start looking at ideas like this, the one thing that strikes me is pharmaceuticals. They come up with a drug, they issue it to everyone. And I think when we look at the RH factors, there's a lot of difference in people's, even down to the basic blood type. But how is it that you can be issuing chemical medicines if you don't even understand how the factors of the most basic thing, a red blood cell, uh, work? Jump in, Wayne. It's kind of interesting that... uh... RH positive blood has a completely different physical structure uh, on the surface of the cells than the RH negative blood. So, I mean, that in and of itself should be something that uh, should be taken into consideration when they're manufacturing different kinds of medications or or uh, different things like that. So, you got to wonder, like, what is this for? And up until, uh, you know, they did these studies and stuff in the early 2000s, that's when they discovered uh, that this glycoprotein layer was likely... Uh, a transporter for CO2 and for ammonium. 
up until that point, nobody knew what this physiological difference was like what what the difference was between the two, like what purpose that this thing served, that this glycoprotein layer served on these cells. But uh, once you find out that this is what scientifically they're saying it does, is it's an ammonium transporter and CO2 transporter, that's important because that's talking about eliminating waste materials from our bloodstream and from, you know, the cells of our body. So how this is done uh, by the body's physiology is an important factor to take into consideration for a lot of these things. And uh, I find it uh, a little hard to fathom that, uh, you know, the uh, the community that uh, works on uh, like these drug delivery systems and stuff uh, doesn't take this into consideration when they're manufacturing things. I think there's more to it than, on uh, you know, what they're telling us on the surface. Well, you'd have to imagine that the most basic blood type would have a have a meaning for any kind of medication that's going to get done. But let me see if I understand this. So the RH positive, if you look up pictures of RH positive cells, they have all these little protrusions, right? And I, do you remember what those are called, Wayne? I'd have to look to the notes. It's called an antigenic glycoprotein layer. Right. So the antigens, you can go online and look up the different blood types and you'll see that they're classified A, A, B, so on. And each one's a little different. So if I'm understanding what you're laying down here, the positive RH positive, which means they have a positive rhesus factor. Um, the, num- the name to reiterate comes from the rhesus macaque monkey. Not kidding. The positive rhesus factor it's assumed that those the sac and the antigens play a role in the in the ammonium and CO2 elimination, but the negative no rhesus factor um, somehow does it differently. Is that correct? That's my understanding of it, uh, because what they've discovered is that uh, glycoprotein layer on the uh, surface of uh, of the cell walls or cell membranes, actually, let's, let's be, you know, a little bit uh, more precise with our, our terminology because cell wall is basically associated with plants, uh, cell membrane. So this glycoprotein layer around the cell membrane uh, is actually serves this function in people with the RH positive blood factor. And uh, the people with the RH negative blood factor, they don't have this uh, glycoprotein around the membrane of their cells. So their cells eliminate these waste products differently than people with the RH positive blood. That's a pretty big difference in human beings. And before we move on, I'll just ask you point blank. Uh, in the research you were doing, did you get any sense that current research is still saying RH positive blood types have a direct relation to monkeys somehow, the rhesus macaque um, particularly? Well, there's nothing directly in the scientific literature stating that it, it relates directly to the rhesus macaque monkey. But you could make the argument that the inference is there. There, there definitely there's an inference that people with the RH positive blood factor are somehow associated or related to these monkeys. So uh, even though there's nothing really scientific to link people with RH positive blood type to the monkey directly, the inference is still made. And uh, you can see it all throughout uh, any of this research that you go through. And it's also in Eastern mythology. If you go to India, there's Hanuman, uh, the monkey. Um, I guess I'll call it a god for the sake of conversation, but I don't think that's the way we think of a god is not the proper um, way to think about Hanuman. Uh, Hanuman is a rhesus macaque, from my understanding. They have temples there where the monkeys are honored and never harmed, and those are rhesus macaques. So for some reason, the rhesus macaque is a big deal. Anyhow, go ahead, Jason, take us on. You know, what's interesting is I do have to question whether or not pharmaceutical companies have to address the fact that 15% of the population is RH negative. So I wonder if that's significant in any way, shape, or form with the way certain drugs might affect the body differently between the positive and negative. What's a strange thing is the O-type. Apparently, the O-type has no sac or membrane around the cell at all. And this started to get me thinking about the claims that somehow they have extrasensory perceptions, they can read minds, they can do all these things. And by the way, when we posted that last episode, there were a ton of people that said, I'm O positive, I'm O negative, I can't wear a watch or the watch will stop. Uh, my eyes change color uh, with my mood and, and things like this, which was right out of the research we did. Anyhow, I stepped on you, Wayne. Uh, that's OK. I was just going to say that it seems to me, just from what I could see in the mainstream that uh, these drug manufacturers and stuff, they, they don't take 
blood type into consideration for a lot of these things. So it, it's kind of a strange thing that this high of a percentage of, of the people in the world, their their bodies process things differently, but they're they're not taking this into account when they're manufacturing these things. So, you know, it, the kind of one size fits all attitude uh, from the drug makers is not necessarily I think the whole story going on here, I think maybe, you know, secretly they do look at some of these things and, uh, you know, different non-disclosed programs. But uh, basically on the face of it, when you look at what the drug manufacturers are doing, they don't take any of this stuff into consideration. Well, here's a crazy thing. If we look at the opioid epidemic, uh, where I guess nobody in charge can possibly figure out who the pusher is. I can figure out who the pusher is. But to get to the point here, uh, many of the codeines and opiates uh, have were paired with heavy doses of acetaminophen. I did research on this a couple of years ago, and basically your, your body reaches a saturation point based on your weight and other things. So presumably that becomes waste material. So what we're saying here is there's a difference between how an RH negative, no relation to the rhesus macaque idea, and the RH positive get rid of waste materials. So I'm with you all day long, Wayne. How can it possibly be that people making medications, um, particularly things like acetaminophen, that are going to saturate your body at some point and then have to be removed as waste, uh, it's, it's handled differently by these types. Right. And just to add a little point to what you're saying, this is just a little side note, but acetaminophen has also been uh, documented to help open up the blood brain barrier for uh, different uh, things to get in there. So, you know, that's an interesting little aside that goes along with that. Yeah, nobody's no, nobody's aware of that. Right. Uh, anyhow, go ahead, Jason. This also suggests a possible answer to the question as to why the elite would allow the geoengineering programs, genetic modification of foods, vaccine agenda, etc. to go on. If they believe that their bodies process out these waste products differently than ours, then we don't know what would affect them differently than most of us. Now, this is an idea that Wayne came up with in his research when he began to realize that the elimination of waste is different between RH negative and positive. To be completely clear to people, RH negative is rare compared to RH positive blood types. To be completely uh, make it understood, the RH positive is the rhesus macaque factor. Now, when Jason and I did the research, we found a lot of places uh, where there was a high occurrence of RH negative and these people were claiming they're the original people. Also in Africa, the original Africans, we found research that's, that suggests that African descent people with the RH negative factor on their blood type, they were claiming they are the original people. So when you start to think about, you know, this is the vexing question. Why the hell would they spray heavy metals and all these things in the air? Don't they have children too? Uh, this is an interesting idea Wayne came up with. And when you start to take it out to kind of a not so nice eventuality, if we think that way, could it just be simply reducing RH positives? Hard to know. Right. And this is one of those things where, you know, you, you really have to question this because uh, this is a definite possibility. If uh, the RH negative factor people, their bodies eliminate wastes and stuff differently than RH positive, then who's to say for sure? Maybe maybe they know very well what they're doing. And maybe some of these things that are more harmful uh, to us in these dosages are not as uh, harmful to these people, these quote unquote elite family royal bloodlines. So who could say for sure? But I mean, th this definitely offers some kind of an explanation as to the why. Why would they let this stuff go on? Because people ask me that all the time. Like, you know, don't these people have children and stuff? Don't they, you know, why would they do this knowing full well that they themselves are exposed to this stuff? And perhaps the answer is it's because maybe it's not as much of a of a burden on their bodies. And I think this RH negative factor may play a role in that. And this may be, you know, kind of a door leading to some more answers. So I would encourage anybody out there, look into this and see, you know, what you can find. I mean, the, the RH negative uh, bloodline trail is definitely a very convoluted one to go down. So this is brand new. And in my in my from my point of view, Wayne, uh, the idea that you're putting forward could be groundbreaking, but it's brand new. And when we do research for an episode like this, we're not really going off on tangents. 
So the point I would make is, you know, so many people ask, why would they put fluoride in all the water? Um, there's a couple, you know, what if there's land masses we don't know anything about or other things? But this comes down to brass tacks. Uh, if Wayne is correct in his assessment that the elimination of waste products from the body is handled differently from an RH positive factor and an RH negative factor, then maybe this is a possible avenue to look down for things like fluoride, the heavy metals that are sprayed into the air to control whether these types of things. There are several distinct haplogroup types that are known to have a higher occurrence of RH negative blood types. The powers that be who monitor all of these things are obsessed with one particular haplogroup of this blood type. This is called haplogroup X and is associated primarily with the Basque people and secondarily with the Ashkenazi Jews. Regardless of the fact that there is little to no scientific evidence that there is anything overtly special about this group, the powers that be still attribute a sort of privileged status to these blood type groups. We will examine the historical ties of where this elitist ideology comes from, how it relates to blood types, and why the elite regard these blood types as special. And I don't think there's any denying this. Um, we can look at things like the first Jesuit, uh, Loyola, the guy who who was the first Jesuit founder. Uh, he comes from the Basque region. As I mentioned before, Jason and I actually made contact with a guy living in the Basque region. If I remember, he was an architect uh, who had been following the show. Um, and it's been shown over and over again that the Ashkenazi and from from right now, I suspect that the Ashkenazi Jew bloodline uh, has little to do with the regular Jewish bloodline we're familiar with in Israel, but uh, that remains to be seen. But we've seen all kinds of research claiming that the IQs are off the charts across the board with the Ashkenazi bloodlines. Um, what would you add, Wayne? Uh, I would add that, uh, yeah, I definitely agree with you that uh, this whole kind of thing with the, the bloodlines of the Ashkenazi Jews. It has nothing to do with the traditional uh, Jewish religion or, 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 you know, Jewish people. Uh, this is something wholly different. And uh, we'll go down this uh, line of research a little later. But the, the Basque people and the Ashkenazi Jews are kind of tied together in the past together. So these are the, the same mm -hmm. core bloodlines uh, coming, emerging from two different parts of the world. So this is what we'll take a look at later. But I also just wanted to point out that uh, the haplogroup that these elites look for is known as haplogroup X. And there's your homage to Saturn right there in haplogroup X. There's a little more I can add. Orson Welles apparently, well, not apparently, I know certainly I've seen the film, went to the Basque region to do films on the culture of the Basques. Um, it was not clear to me whether he had some relation, but it was kind of implied that Orson Welles did have some tie to the Basque region. Very interested in it, makes a black and white film of of all going on there. Now, the Basque region actually uh, encompasses two countries. Um, I think it goes over the border into, oh, geez, is it Spain, Wayne? Yeah, Spain is definitely part of it. Yeah, I think, Spain. Uh, some, some areas in France, too. Right. So Spain and France. Now, here's, here's the backstory on the Basque people. And by the way, they have an incredible tradition of food, natural food, by the way, just so people know. They're still growing good, healthy foods. But they were a basically a seafaring race, boat maker people. That has changed in recent times. But when Jason and I made contact back in the day and we talked one-to-one, -one, I asked point blank, uh, I always try to figure out what the, the origin stories of peoples are. I did it recently with the uh, the Indian tribe called the Pequots, um, and uh, they have one of the biggest casinos in the world here. But I went to their museum to try to figure out what their origin story was. For the Basque people, apparently, we were told that within their community, uh, they tell each other, not so much histor you know history, but they tell each other that they are somehow related to Atlantis, and it sunk beneath the sea. They came to... To where they are now and they made boats for a very long time just to get all that on the record jason let's begin by examining what is known about rh negative blood types rhesus factor has recently been understood to control renal function and male fertility it regulates acidity in the blood human blood generally has a slightly alkaline ph of 7.4 in rh positive blood the extra protein associated with rhd called RHAG that is attached to the red blood cell membrane helps to control acidity in the blood. The mechanism that helps regulate this in RH people 
is unknown. This can lead us to speculate on the following idea. RH negative people are said to have greater resistance to cancer. It has been shown that cancer cannot survive in an alkaline environment. Therefore, since the mechanism of action that regulates acidity in RH negative people is unknown, it could be speculated that perhaps their blood is slightly more alkaline than what is normally accepted. And this may, therefore, confer some resistance to cancer. So again, this is another heck of an idea, Wayne. Uh, we broached it, but not in the way you're doing it here. Uh, if there is any truth or correctness to the idea that RH negative people uh, have less occurrences of cancer, and we know certainly that cancer rates are skyrocketing, although I think history is actually trying to tell you that it's going down right now. What we're looking at is RH positive people would be more affected. And since most of the world is apparently RH positive, uh, that would be a big reduction in RH positive bloodlines. Yeah, it certainly would look that way. But I mean, once again, these are things that that we really need to consider because uh, there's definitely something to this. I mean, this is what, you know, the scientific community has found is that uh, these differences, these RH positive red blood cells eliminate toxins differently than RH negative ones. So with that being said, I mean, you know, if we're not sure what the uh, mechanism of action is for RH negative people with a lot of this stuff, then it could be construed that uh, perhaps there is something different going on where they do have some kind of uh, more of a resistance to these type of things. Because, I mean, you know, it, people you talk to, they, they do uh, associate these specific traits with RH negative. So maybe there's something to it. And if there is, this could be scientific validation of that. It's a bit much to take that in this present day and age of technology, somehow nobody understands anything about the RH negative uh, type, and they understand all kinds of things about RH positive. And then if you go look up how the positive or negative got attached to blood, directly relatable to the rhesus macaque, as I mentioned before, way back in history, uh, Hanuman, the monkey god, for lack of better terms, uh, is rhesus macaque or associated with rhesus macaque. Uh, I'm just not buying. And when Jason and I did the research, we found so much contradictory information. It, it was you know, front and center to me uh, that something's being covered up here. It felt that way to me. Uh, but anyhow, Jason, as you pick up, I think the Latin you're about to have to say is pronounced Gondii with the double I on the end there. You know, I remember from the first time we did this, certain articles were even having a snottiness to them. About right. People with RH negative versus people with RH positive. But the funny thing about that was, is it was conflicting information about who would be the superior, quote unquote. The original person, <laughs> the original human, right? Yeah, it was a mixed bag of which race was claiming to be the superior earliest man, whatever you want to call it kind of thing. And so it was a very odd thing. And it seems like that really hasn't changed with Wayne doing research in, along the same lines. No, it, it really hasn't changed because I, I've encountered the same same type things in my research. And you could see where... Uh, it seems to me, and we'll get into this more later, that there there may be two different factions at the top of the power structure that are kind of trying to battle it out for superiority there. And, you know, this might be part and parcel of that going on. So who's who could say for sure? Well, there's an interesting thing going on in the European research. The claim was, oh, the RH negatives over here are the original people. Same thing in the African research. Uh, we are the original people uh, stating that most original African descent human beings had the RH ne negative blood factor. What, what we noticed was that that was suppressed information. But here's an interesting thing. Uh, I don't know if you found anything different. Apparently, the lowest occurrence of RH negative uh, in culture, in uh, how would I say this, in genetic groups is Asians. Asians have the lowest occurrence. And uh, I'm pulling from memory here, Wayne, I think it's like two or three percent it's really low for Asian races to have an RH negative factor. The one thing that I think I could state pretty surely is if you set aside that the European research and the African research were butting heads about who the original humans are, it was pretty clear that they both thought RH negative were the original humans. And that brings up another problem. If that was true somehow, um, then how do you end up with European white races and African black races? You see, you can't balance that equation. I don't think Darwin's going to come along and make up some story to account for that. Well, wouldn't that also put a discrepancy in with the concept of evolution? Yes. 
if humans are supposed to be mutated versions of earlier mammals, wouldn't it be the other way around? I think in some ways the RH factor proves the nonsensical nature of Darwin as we currently accept it. Uh, you can't balance the scales there. No, you certainly can't. Uh, I, I would tend to agree. I, I think this is definitely something that flies in the face of Darwinian evolution when you look at it, because it just defies logic that a certain percentage of the people would develop this glycoprotein layer, like the large majority of them, and, and the rest of them wouldn't, uh, the, the small portion uh, of the RH negative people. And uh, it, it's kind of strange that it seems just from the anecdotal evidence that the RH negative people, they, they have uh, more benefits from not having this glycoprotein layer. So that kind of flies in the face of what they say evolution is and how it works, doesn't it? It does. By the length of time we're told evolution is going to occur, there wouldn't be enough time in this world or any other world or five of our worlds to come up with the differences. But, you know, we, we kind of already know that there's already people around pointing out, you know, the guy, what was the guy's name? Crick or somebody. I don't know if it was Crick who said this. One of the guys associated with the supposed discovery of the double helix said for this to have occurred randomly would be the same as a hurricane going through a junkyard and fashioning a completely functional jet airplane on the other side. So even the people in the community have said similar things that we're saying here. They're just not the, the ones that make it into the textbooks. Yeah, that's the whole thing. It all reeks of agenda. Yeah, it does. It, 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 uh, of all the topics we've done, um, this one is among the most hidden and most, I won't say lied about, but it's not being addressed openly as so many of the other topics we address are. And I think your idea here that RH positive uh, handling waste products in the body differently, that could turn out to be a big deal. RH negative blood types have an innate resistance to a protozoa parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. This is touted as one of the main evolutionary advantages conferred by having this blood type. So, what is Toxoplasma gondii? Let's look at this because once again, this this brings up the question: If evolution's correct, wouldn't it stand to reason that uh, you know the the RH negative uh, bloodline would be more prevalent than the RH positive. So that's, that's one of those things. But the, one of the main things I've found through this scientific research is one of the only things that they could say scientifically for certain that is a benefit for RH negative blood types is this resistance to this Toxoplasma gondii. So uh, we could go ahead and take a look at what exactly is this. Toxoplasma gondii is a parasitic protozoan that can infect most animals and humans, but it is only known to reproduce in felines. It can alter people's behavior. Could it be possible that RH-positive blood types are more prone to mind control manipulation than RH-negative blood types because of this connection? It seems that there is a possibility. Let's just read it, uh, a little bit of information here that we have about uh, this Toxoplasma gondii. <laughs> in humans, Toxoplasma gondii is one of the most common parasites in developed countries. Serological studies estimate that 30 to 50 percent of the global population has been exposed to and may be chronically infected with Toxoplasma gondii, although infection rates differ significantly from country to country. For example, previous estimates have shown the highest prevalence of persons infected to be in France at 84%. Although mild flu-like symptoms occasionally occur during the first few weeks following exposure, infection with Toxoplasma gondii produces no readily observable symptoms in healthy human adults. This asymptomatic state of infection is referred to as a latent infection and has recently been associated with numerous subtle adverse or pathological behavioral alterations in humans. Though it has been shown recently that the association between behavioral changes and infection with Toxoplasma gondii is weak. In infants, HIV, AIDS patients, and others with weakened immunity, infection may cause a serious and occasionally fatal illness. Now, let's uh, take a look at a little bit more of what we know about this. Toxoplasma gondii has been shown to alter the behavior of infected rodents in ways that increase the rodent's chances of being preyed upon by felines. So uh, that's interesting right there. <laughs> Support for this manipulation hypothesis stems from studies showing Toxoplasma gondii infected rats have a decreased aversion to cat urine. Because cats are the only host 
which uh, toxoplasmic gondii can sexually reproduce to complete and begin its life cycle. Such behavioral manipulations are thought to be evolutionary adaptations that increase the parasite's reproductive success. The rate would not shy away from areas where cats live and would also be less able to escape should a, a cat try to prey on them. The primary mechanisms of Toxoplasma gondii induced behavioral changes in rodents is now known to occur through epigenetic remodeling in neurons, which governs associated behaviors. And that's important to remember, epigenetic remodeling. So that, that's a term that's going to come up uh, a lot in the near future, you'll see. For example, it modifies epigenetic methylation to cause hypomethylation of arginine vasopressin-related genes in medial amygdala to greatly decrease predator aversion. Now, this is just um, an example where they, they did these experiments in rats, and they showed that this goes on. So uh, this will be important later, and we'll see why. And once again, I mean, it, it talks about in this little article here about uh, how the rats don't seem to have an aversion to cat urine and things like that. Uh, but here's the important part. Let's skip down to the important part. A number of studies have suggested that subtle behavioral or personality changes may occur in infected humans. And infection with the parasite has recently been associated with a number of neurological disorders, particularly schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. A 2015 study also found cognitive deficits in adults to be associated with joint infection by both Toxoplasma gondii and Helicobacter pylori in a regression model with controls for race, ethnicity, and educational attainment. Although a causal relationship between latent toxoplasmosis with these neurological phenomena has not yet been established, preliminary evidence suggests that toxoplasma gondii infection may induce some of the same alterations in the human brain as observed in mice. And there's the bottom line. So it wasn't too, too many years ago, uh, I think, when I first heard the news talk about cats carrying something uh, that, that people had to be concerned with. But this is all well and good, but I have a real problem when they're talking about this and they start going over to HIV AIDS. Before the censorship hit places like YouTube, there were doctors out there showing that the AIDS test was nonsense. I grew up in the heart of AIDS, in the heart of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I never knew a single person who had AIDS. Every time I say this, people come along and flip out, but I'm pointing out my observations here. I don't accept AIDS or HIV as described, and I don't understand how you need to constantly mix these ideas in with these other things that are going on. Uh, it's a bit like television. Right now, television in, and movies are fascinated with uh, mental health. That's the new buzzword. Uh, and from the, and I'll tell you why. From the recent research Jason and I did, uh, China already has a definition for mental health. You know what it is? Anyone who doesn't agree with the government is mentally defective. Um, we see the same thing going on here. It's in music. It's in TV ads. It's in movies. It's everywhere. And not only that, we see the uh, hyping of you know the Sheldon Cooper type characters to try to normalize autism. That's my main basis for the problem with the HIV. RH negative blood types do have some negative attributions associated with them as well, which may answer some questions about motivations of the elite bloodlines. RH factor has been shown to control renal function and male fertility, and as such, scientific evidence suggests that males with RH negative blood types have lower fertility rates. This means that in order to propagate RH negative factor, it is more probable to do so with a male that carries the RH negative factor as a recessive trait. This would explain why certain cultures track heritage through the female lineage rather than the male. This would also explain why the elite royal bloodlines sometimes intermarry with commoner blood types. And here's another thing, you know, if we want to accept the whole narrative about royalty, uh, which how can you ignore it? Um, they clearly knew the difference in the blood types. They clearly knew it. I mean, what would you add, Wayne? I would add that it seems to me that at the top parts of the power structure, uh, these people know more about this blood type, this RH negative blood type, than what they allow out to the public. Uh, you could see the obfuscation going on with a lot of these different things we've talked about. I mean, we're just laying down like some of the scientific things we've found with this RH factor and, and some of the possibilities that this could lead to. But uh, I think at the higher ends of the echelon, 
they know what the primary differences are between Rh positive and Rh negative, and they they know vastly more about Rh negative blood than what they let on. So how could it be way back in the day, two, three, four hundred years ago, uh, they knew all about these blood types? But here's the proof. If you go up to something as modern day, which you can track its lineage for the breeding of horses back to Lord knows when, go to the Triple Crown. Hint, hint, hint. Triple Crown. Not triple horse, not triple, you know, race, triple crown horse races down in Kentucky. The bloodline story there. Uh, It's all about champion bloodlines. And once you get a winning stud, that champion bloodline is used to breed, isn't it, with other champion female horses. This has been going on forever. So the idea that somehow these were unknown ideas and, and somehow currently the best science that exists in the world doesn't understand the difference between RH factor negative and positive and how the waste is removed from the body, it just it rings hollow to me, man. You know, this obsession that the elite have with intermarrying and trying to keep this thing going really has a serious dual-edged effect because how many derp de have they produced throughout history, too? Well, I began to question that, too, because I noticed in a lot of television shows back in the day and movies, they were making jokes about, oh, you know, these first cousins or something uh, were having children and they were getting, what was the word, flipperhead babies or something. But it was done in a way that made me to question. And I actually had had a note to contact someone from the AKC who breeds dogs and see if there is an actual scientific history of how close you can, you know, breed things before really adverse things happen. But who can forget the story of the supposed czars? The last czars were supposedly all hemophiliac. So what are we looking at there? Is that real or is that a story? Hard things to know. Well, with dogs, you can sometimes see it. We used to have white Samoyeds when I was younger. and ha, So did we. <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful dogs. Very sweet, very loving. But we had one with a genetic condition that uh, we had to put her to sleep, unfortunately. And it was because they blatantly told us they breed them too closely together and it gets passed down way too easily. Well, I think it could probably be easily demonstrated that a bigger gene pool makes more diversity, for lack of better terms here. No doubt. I think it would just be an interesting thing to look at the actual science, which I've never done. I had notes to do it, to see how closely um, horses or anything else have been bred and what the result of that is. Um, Because I saw the ideas being echoed all over the place. And, And, you know, certainly from the stories we're told, you know, the kings and queens of France would... Uh, do a match make with someone from Germany of the royal lines. We saw it. All the royal lines everywhere, their gene pool was apparently so small. Um, And that starts to talk to, if any of that is correct, it starts to talk to why there are less RH negative people in the world, doesn't it? But it does not explain how we got the difference. No, it sure doesn't. Apart from the scientifically based physical characteristics, there are a great many mystical contexts and esoteric traditions associated with RH negative bloodlines and their origins. We will examine the history of this underground stream and the archetypes that it carries forward through time. Okay, I think this is where we start to really get into the meat and potatoes of what this whole RH negative bloodline thing is really all about. We've gone through basically here. In the, in the first part, the scientific things that, that back up these differences that show that some of these traits and stuff associated with RH negative may have some merit to them. There might be a there there. <clears throat> now that we've determined that, and we also know for a fact that the people in these elite power structure groups are just completely obsessed with, with bloodlines and royal bloodline lineage and stuff like that, that they're looking at this RH negative factor as one of the major things to look for within their small group that they they keep together, their small family bloodlines, the the genetic material that they're looking for. So uh, this leads back to some older esoteric ideas and stuff, and we're going to go ahead and, and get into that part of it now, because this is, I think, the important facet of the work on the RH negative that we've done. I think whenever you can go back to Greek myth and find some traces of whatever you're looking at, um, it's pay dirt. And we're about to read some notes here. If I'm not mistaken, and correct me if you know better, uh, we're going to talk about a king from Thrace. Thracian king, uh, and you'll remember that from the supposed gladiators. One of the forms of gladiators we were told was Thracian. I think that's modern-day Belgium. Uh, If I'm wrong, someone can correct me. Go ahead, Jason. First, let's look at the origin of the term Rhesus. Rhesus was one of the gods of Greek myth. 
what do we know about him? He was a Thracian king, son of a muse, and a prophet of Bacchus, widely celebrated in the Bacchic mysteries by its initiates. Also given the attribution of being the leader of the famous Thracian horsemen, or Heros Equitans. Once again, the esoteric connotation of the equestrian shows up here. Equestrian in the esoteric language means one who is well-versed in the phonetic Kabbalah. This is pointing out to initiates to pay special attention to words and symbols associated with the topic at hand. In this case, anything you see with the word resus associated with it needs to be carefully scrutinized for hidden meanings. There was recorded to be a cult of resus in the ancient Greek territories. He was purported to be a mighty hunter and dwell in the caves of Mount Pangium. His mother, the muse, prophesied that he would not go under the black earth. This is a veiled reference to alchemy. This could be interpreted that he could not transcend this plane. Okay, well, we could see here once again the the ties to this whole equestrian idea. And uh, we've gone through this in one of the previous shows uh, about, I think it was the one where we talked about Virgil, the the Enid, where you can see that a lot of these people who who have... uh, this hidden stream of knowledge that they they keep from people. They use certain terms to bring attention to some of the points and symbols that they use uh, throughout their narratives of things. And once again, this word equestrian comes up in this whole idea of the horsemen and breeders of horses. And and this once again ties back, uh, as we had discussed in that episode, to a form of Kabbalah called the phonetic Kabbalah, which is different from what they traditionally call Kabbalah, which was the, the Jewish tradition of Kabbalah. And uh, there's there's a difference there. And I would encourage people to to try and dig into it. it it's kind of uh, tough research to go through, but there's definitely something to it. And you'll see if you could trace it back uh, through different things, like through the works of Falconelli, where uh, it gets pointed out that uh, Kabbalah with a C is different than Kabbalah with a K. And, and this refers to uh, the phonetic Kabbalah, the Kabbalah with a C. And this, once again, this is one of the ways that these people within these secret societies and secret groups, this is how they convey different esoteric meanings to people who would be in the know. They use certain code words and stuff like this. And I've found this all through different kinds of different scientific researches and stuff I've gone through too. Once you you get to understand what it is that they're doing, how they're using different words and stuff as code for other things, you could start to read hidden meanings and things. So when I was going down the line of looking for rhesus, I thought, well, let's go back to the origins of where the term or the word rhesus came from. And sure enough, it was a Greek god. So uh, when I started looking into this uh, mythology of rhesus, I found there was a Thracian cult of rhesus, and he was said to be the leader of the Thracian horsemen. And once I saw the tie in with these uh, heroes, equitons, equitons, equestrian, once again, it ties back to this whole phonetic Kabbalah idea. So this points out to you immediately that anything associated with rhesus, the god rhesus, that they use in any kind of a, a modern way, you have to look for the hidden underground stream meaning of what it is. So it's telling you, okay, this whole idea, the ideas associated with this, the things you're going to read in it, you have to look deeper. You have to look at the esoteric meaning of these things. So you have to look beyond the surface reading. And that's kind of where we came to with this whole thing. So uh, if you want, we can take a look at the Thracian cult of Rhesus and and some of the insights that we get from it. I, I included it in the notes. I don't know if it's anything we necessarily have to go completely through to read the whole thing, but we could point out some of the key ideas in there. Well, here's one thing that I notice uh, from the notes. Cicero is claiming, uh, Cicero of Roman fame, supposed ancient Rome, is claiming there is no cult of uh of rhesus and this is a bit ironic uh, anyone who knows the accepted uh roman history there was a couple what's called triumvirates yeah i'm doing this from memory i hope i don't mess it up i think it's the second triumvirate that has to do with octavian mark antony anyhow there's you know antony comes out on top ends up the caesar augustus but during the course of that cicero is killed the point i'm making here is that cicero was in the circles the highest circles of roman power so here we have a roman saying there's nothing to it when in fact we can find that there was something to it so even all the way back 
this here, whenever this might have been, the circles of power are trying to brush it under the rug. Right. And this is a way that they kind of divert attention from something important for, you know, anybody who may be onto the trail. So you got a guy like Cicero saying, God, oh, there's nothing to this. So for the past how many thousands of years or who knows with our convoluted timeline, how long ago it really was, people have largely accepted, especially like in a lot of these more educated circles, that there's nothing to this idea. But uh, some things have shown that there are. I think it's probably beneficial if we read some of the information here about Rhesus. Let me jump in real quick. You want to act like there's nothing to it. I think you're missing the boat. If we go to ancient India, we have a Hanuman. That's about Rhesus. If we go to the Greek myth, which Wayne is about to do, we have God or maybe a demigod named Rhesus. We'll get into it. So clearly there's something here. Okay, let's take a, a look here. In her ideological narrative towards the end of Rhesus, between 962 and 973, Rhesus' mother, a muse, describes her son's posthumous fate and declares that he will not go under the black earth. We discussed that whole connotation a little earlier, but will rather continue his existence by assuming a new identity as a man god, namely an entity betwixt and between man and deity. In this new interstitial capacity, the muse says, Rhesus will inhabit forever a subterranean cavern somewhere in Mount Pangeum and will act as prophet of Bacchus. All of this has been sometimes dismissed as poetic fancy, most vehement, vehemently perhaps by a, one Mr. W. Leaf, who invoked Cicero's statement to the effect that there was no cult of Rhesus anywhere in the ancient world. However, apart from the fact that this can at best have been valid only for Cicero's time, there's no evidence that Cicero founded his statement on serious Alexandrian scholarship, as Leaf thought. On the contrary, the De Natura Deorum contains a number of misunderstandings and false assumptions, and Cicero does sometimes seem to have given himself a free hand in the treatment of his sources. So I think this is a little bit important right there. Uh, this basically is saying that, you know, Cicero was misquoting sources in a lot of this. Like he was going to different sources that were not necessarily found to be true, except maybe in his time. It says something there. It kind of reeks of kind of a, a cover up of this information. So once again, we could see where, you know, a guy like Cicero could come out and say, you know, there's nothing to this to try and cover up like the hidden meaning for the initiates within these things. And that's that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Like you have to look through a lot of these myths and stuff to kind of garner information out of there. And it, it's difficult to do at times. But once you understand a couple key concepts and words, you can start doing this stuff yourself and, and tear meanings out of things that are kind of hidden underneath the surface. Yeah, you know, just on the face of it, Cicero was, from what we were told, is in the highest circles of power to the point where when Octavian's about to become Augustus, um, I think that's the point. hope I'm not messing this up. I read it about three months ago again. Uh, Cicero's put to death. That's how much of a political threat he was. Um, but he has so many writings attributed to him. You know, whenever I hear someone that's this high up in circles of power say a thing is not, I automatically assume it is. And I start looking to find out. Pay special attention to the motif of the hunter and the cave dweller. This is the origin of the whole idea of the caveman. Rhesus was also said to ward off pestilence, and thus had the attribution of a healer associated with him. We will also see later how a dynamic arises between the hunter and the farmer, the civilized man, and the caveman. All of these things tie their roots in the same archetype as the RH factor. So, Wayne, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Why don't you go ahead and take a crack at this? But these are key points, aren't they? Um, the, the idea, the, the alchemical encode about not going under the black earth. But here it's stating flat out that Rhesus is going to live in a cave. So there's a bit of contradiction going on here, isn't there? And also the idea that somehow uh, Rhesus must be the idea of RH positive, or do I have it backwards? Uh, and there's a healer attribution. See, that's the whole thing. And that's what I found in this whole dichotomy of doing this research is you get both of these things, both of these opposing viewpoints as to which one is which. And that, once again, I think there directly correlates to, you know, maybe uh, a struggle between two uh, opposing factions at the top of the power structure working with different continuity of ideas. So uh, the important thing that uh, I think people need to take from this bullet point is when you see the connotation of caveman 
and uh, you see the the word caveman or anything associated with it, Neanderthal, Denisovan, that's one that's come up recently that they're doing a lot of work on. This does not mean what you think it means, guys. This is hidden code word. This is for people in the know. Let's pull it up to modern times. Was it Geico or I forget the insurance company? Even a caveman can do it. You understand what's going on here? And I'll, I'll be blunt about it. So here we're finally being told that Rhesus is going to go live in a cave. Clearly, there's the caveman, right? He's living in a cave. But you see, the implication here is between a hunter and a farmer and the civilized man and the caveman. Now, Wayne, do you agree with me? I'm going to say that the the impression they're trying to impose here is the civilized man is RH negative and the caveman is RH positive. Where are you with that? Right. That's that's one uh, where I could see. And what we have to understand is the civilized man and caveman dichotomy and the the hunter and the farmer dichotomy. These are two separate ways of viewing it, and they're actually opposites. So we'll go down that road later, too, and show how uh, these things come at each other at opposing viewpoints, but they could still directly tie themselves one another with the RH negative contribution or yeah, attribution of things. So it's interesting. And like I said, this whole dichotomy of thought comes about, and I think a lot of it's through obfuscation. But like I said, the important takeaway for that last bullet point is, guys, caveman does not mean what you think it means. And we'll get more into that in an hour too. Well, here's the irony of it. If you do take something like the Geico commercials, which were actually very popular while they were poking you in the eye, I mean, you could make the assumption that the idea here is the people who own this corporation are RH negative. The people they're making fun of are RH positive, who are the cavemen, because even a caveman can do it, which is 80 some percent or something like that of the overall population we're aware of in this world. Anyhow, that does bring us to the top of the hour in hour one. Uh, We're going to be able to open up a little more wide in hour two, as is always true, uh, we have to moderate or the content gets censored or any number of things in this ridiculous world where corporations think they have the right to control free speech, not down with it. So show up with us over at crow777radio.com where we exercise free speech and we're going to go down all these avenues. And this topic is a pretty big deal. It's not easy to get to the bottom of it. There is so much contradiction going on, but we can draw the lines all day. Um, What it comes down to is the specials are negative. The averages or the lessers or the cavemen are positive from the rhesus macaque factor, as it is so named. Anyhow, join us all over at crow777radio.com for the second hour of 187. There it is, man. Cheers. (laughs) 